Welcome everyone and thank you for attending this webinar. The 1422 Chronic Disease Prevention Initiative started in July of 2015 and it ends this month, September 2018. One component of the very extensive work plan was developing community use agreements and policies for the purpose of encouraging physical activity. In Franklin County, we did work on this but we also received numerous requests from the community to provide training on community use for the purpose of food access. I asked our technical assistance provider, the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation in the form of Sarah Downer, if they could provide such a training on community use for the purpose of food access um, after they had already done two trainings on community access for physical activity. At the same time this conversation was happening, Heidi Stecker from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council was working with the Conservation Law Foundation to develop a legal guide for community kitchens. After some discussion and bringing in additional partners from the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, the Franklin County Community Development Corporation, Whole Harmony, and the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, we came up for the, with the plan for this workshop. Uh, the agenda for this webinar includes the welcome and introduction and then an introduction to the Community Development Corporation, an overview of community use and objectives, uh, community kitchens, the fundamentals, and a legal guide for community kitchens and an introduction to whole harmony. Since this is a recorded webinar, we will not be able to take live questions, unfortunately. Um, but we will provide, at the end of this webinar, we will provide all of our contact information, so please feel free to contact any of us if you have any questions after the webinar. I would like to pass the microphone now to jo Joanna Benoit from the Franklin County Community Development Corporation. All right, hello, my name is Joanna Benoit. I am the Food Systems Program Manager for the Franklin County Community Development Corporation. Um, and the Western Massachusetts Food Processing Center. Um, a little overview of who we are. The Franklin County CDC is an economic development nonprofit based in um, Greenfield, Massachusetts. We were founded in 1979. Our mission is to stimulate a more vital rural economy and to maximize community control over um, our community. The Food Processing Center was opened in 2001 and is a shared use commercial kitchen aimed at promoting best practices for food producers. Um, we see about 45 to 55 businesses of all different sizes across the Northeast region uh, use this space annually. Um, we are a fully FDA inspected kitchen with uh, fully developed and implement, implemented standard operating procedures um, for our clients to use. Between the CDC and the Food Processing Center, we provide comprehensive services for beginning and growing food businesses. Um, <clears throat> we provide in-depth business development support, including um, individual counseling and business planning support. We also provide uh, in-house business lending. We are the administration for the PB Grows Investment Fund and also the newly funded Massachusetts Food Trust, which we were uh, co-awarded. So basically, in, in short, we are a community resource for folks who are embarking on a food entrepreneur or uh, food business journey. Whole Harmony, who it will be presenting today later on, is actually one of our all-star clients, um, and we're very excited to have them a part of this, this webinar. This is Sarah Downer from the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School, and we are thrilled to help bring this training today to you and gather together those who are interested in using different community spaces for food processing and production. So this presentation is really aimed at food entrepreneurs, farmers, those who want to uh, produce a food product or a value-added farm product, or food or meals for donation or sale. Uh, this is also aimed at advocates who are interested in bringing all of those folks together and at making sure that they're able to use the spaces in their community to do this work. And this training is really the beginning of a more detailed and in-depth conversation and knowledge journey that you will need to go on as you uh, start to learn about the process of achieving the goals that you have uh, when it comes to food production and, and food processing. 
So today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about different models of com community and commercial kitchen use. We're going to go over very, very basic information about food processing, including some information about food safety and legal considerations that you should be aware of. Perhaps most importantly, we'll point you to some incredible resources that have more in-depth information. As Rachel mentioned, the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School has been working for a few years in partnership with Franklin County and others across the state to offer resources for those who want to open up space for physical recreation. And so now that we are pivoting to the use of, of kitchen space, but before we do that, we want to highlight the resources that exist for you um, to open up space for physical recreation and, and activity because ultimately we have a shared vision of active, healthy, and vibrant communities where all community spaces from gyms to kitchens to outdoor lawns are true resources for the people who live there. So in 2016, our center produced a toolkit on sharing space for the purpose of physical recreation and activity. You can see it here on this slide and there's a hyperlink that will bring you right to it. In their Massachusetts Community Use Toolkit, you'll find an overview of all of the practical and legal considerations for sharing indoor and outdoor space across Massachusetts, including some very specific uh, laws that you might want to be aware of as you begin to think about opening up your doors. So if you're a school and you want the, to invite the community into your gym, if you're a town hall and you want to invite the community into your space, uh, this is a good place to look to find model community use policies and agreements, sample budgets, timelines, how to manage the risk involved in doing that, and all of the relevant laws and statutes that will help to govern those activities. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cheryl Sabara. I am the senior staff attorney and the director of policy and law for the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards. Some of you, well, all of you involved with food know this, but some may not, that in Massachusetts we have 351 local boards of health, all of whom have the authority to enact local laws, and all of whom also have the authority and the obligation to issue food service permits um, in Massachusetts. So what I'm going to um, attempt to do is to explain the, what sort of food establishments require a local food permit, what those food permits can look like depending upon the type of food establishment before the Board of Health, and um, also describe some new sections of the food code that actually will go into effect on October 5th of this year. They have been very long in the making. We, in Massachusetts, we have been utilizing, believe it or not, the 1999 Federal Food Code. We now have um, incorporated the, I believe it's the 2013 Federal Food Code and then the amendments also address some Massachusetts specific issues. So the type of food establishments that actually require a local permit from your local Board of Health are um, those types of establishments that prepare, package, serve, vend, or otherwise provide food, um, including residential kitchens if they're in beds and breakfasts and residential kitchens that are utilizing cottage food operations. And it's interesting, we'll, we'll go through some definitions that are in the new food code that's effective on October 5th that were not in the previous um, food code for Massachusetts. So um, a residential kitchen delivers food directly or indirectly to a consumer through a delivery service. Also, we have um, mobile, stationary, temporary, or permanent facilities, um, whether the consumption is on or off the premises, like mobile food markets that we will um, describe. So all of those kinds of food establishments require a local food permit from your local Board of Health. There are certain establishments that are not considered food 
establishments, and therefore the local Board of Health cannot require a food permit. And those include any operation that's dealing with just whole, uncut, fresh fruits and vegetables, unprocessed honey, maple products, eggs, um, a food processing plant that requires a different kind of permit, a kitchen that's preparing what we used to call potentially hazardous food, but now um, the new code calls it not time temperature for safety food, um, but it's food that's um, being uh, produced for a religious or charitable organization's bake sale. Um, also a residential kitchen that's preparing food that they will be donating to a charitable facility in a private home that receives catered or home delivered foods. These establishments are not food establishments for the purposes of the food code, therefore no local permit is required. Um, I'm gonna just touch on some definitions that are relevant to what we're talking about today. And some of these, again, as I mentioned, are new definitions or have been amended in some way, shape or form. Um, we are going to be talking about caterers. Um, I think that definition is pretty obvious. Here are some new definitions, however. One is um, a cottage food operation. And that is an operation which takes place in the home kitchen of a person's primary residence and um, sells directly to consumers. That's a new definition. Cottage food products is also a new definition. It's for non-potentially hazardous foods. So baked goods, jams, jellies, and other foods. That is, those are considered cottage food products now. And another new definition is innovative operations. Um, this is not a definition that we've seen before. And innovative operations are really non-traditional food establishments. And we'll go through what the code says about them in a minute. Then we have leased commercial kitchens where kitchen space is provided to individuals and entrepreneur and there is professional equipment on site. These kitchens are leased or rented and you're gonna hear a lot more about that as well. Residential kitchen is one in a private home. Retail, obviously sale to a consumer. Wholesale is you're selling, but you're not selling to the ultimate consumer. You're selling to someone who will be selling to an ultimate consumer. So let's look at cottage food operations um, in residential kitchens. The first thing you wanna make sure is that your local zoning laws permit home businesses. Um, you can find that out um, in your town clerk's office or um, you can or you can find that out by contacting some of the resources um, that we'll be mentioning at the end of this presentation. And again, you are limited to sale of not time temperature control for safety foods. So again, those include baked goods, confectionaries, jams, jellies, herbs, cereals. Um, but the caveat is that you need to have a standard recipe for each of these products that you are producing. And the local Board of Health will inspect before they issue a permit. Um, and the local Board of Health will have a, a, a training requirement that will attach to that permit holder or whoever is doing the baking or the food processing in the residential kitchen. These are foods that cannot be prepared or sold in a cottage food operation. And these are anything that is going to require refrigeration, um, acidified products like pickled products, um, meat that's either fresh or dried, fish or food that's made from cut vegetables. The difference there is that once a vegetable or a fruit is cut, it then requires refrigeration. 
caterers do need a food permit. Um, they are a food permit establishment, and a caterer needs to utilize a permitted food establishment that cannot be a cottage operation. And there needs to be 72-hour notice to a Board of Health in a municipality in which meals will be served, um, and the Board of Health can require a copy of the food service permit for the food establishment where the caterer is doing the cooking. For contract meals, which are delivering ready-to-eat meals, you don't need to have a wholesale food processor permit as long as the food is pre-ordered for single meals or meals that are fully cooked or the meals that are being developed or the meals are stored and delivered under a certain required temperature. Mobile food operations also require a food permit and the permit has to conform to the DPH administrative guidelines, which are yet to be created. The permit is issued for a specified period of time, a specified location, and there can be other local restrictions that are put upon that food permit. And the food permit needs to be obtained wherever the mobile food operation is operating. Now, leased commercial kitchens, these are shared kitchens, they were called in the past, or incubator operations. Both the lessor, the, the, the owner or operator of this commercial kitchen, and the lessees or the users of these commercial kitchens both have to obtain either a retail or wholesale food permit from the local Board of Health, depending upon what the kitchen is being used for. Innovative operations, again, this is a new term in our Massachusetts Food Code, and it's for non-traditional food establishments that aren't specifically listed in the Food Code. Those permits need to be approved as long as they are, and in quote, in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the food code. That's going to be a judgment call that will be made by the Board of Health. We are hopeful that the Department of Public Health will issue some guidance that will help inform local boards of health about how to address these establishments. Donation, food donations, in an attempt to increase food donations, there have been several bills filed right now. What the Mass General Laws say about food donations is that if someone is donating to a food pantry or a soup kitchen, there is no um, personal liability if anyone gets sick from whatever the food was that is donated as long as it's donated in good faith and it's not contaminated. A nonprofit corporation does have to have a food permit when it serves this food, but a fee cannot be charged by a local Board of Health for that permit, and the liability protection also extends to the nonprofit who's distributing or serving the food. Community events. There was a lot of discussion about this. There has been a lot of discussion about this throughout the years. Boards of Health were really provided with little guidance on this. The Department of Public Health did issue a guidance document several years ago, and what the guidance document actually made much more clear that potluck events are not um, required to have a food permit. In fact, Boards of Health really have no authority to regulate these community events except for something that might relate to the nuisance statute. So a potluck event is defined as folks gathering to share food. There's no compensation provided to whoever's bringing the food. This event is not for commercial purposes, and there needs to be a sign somewhere stating that this event has not been inspected by the state or the local Board of Health. Um, these are community events and no permit is required for these. 
then when we start looking at certain value added products, for instance, if we're looking at creating acidified products, then we're looking at things such as salsa, pickles, relishes, marinades, these type of products, these value added products are subject to another part of the food code, which is called the Good Manufacturing Practices, or GMP, for food processing. So if, if an individual or a business is looking to create these kinds of products, then they need to file an application for initial, initial licensure for food processing and or distribution at wholesale. So this application is the same application whether you're doing wholesale processing or food processing. And it's the same license whether you're selling directly to a consumer or you're doing wholesale work. And this is all laid out very specifically on the application, you will check off these sorts of blocks that are on the application that will just indicate what you will be processing. And you need to identify the four most common food products that you will be manufacturing. And the Food Protection Program will provide you with guidance in, in filling out that Form. Hello, I'm Erica Kaiser McKeown. I'm an attorney and senior fellow with the Conservation Law Foundation's Legal Food Hub. The Conservation Law Foundation is a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization, and the Legal Food Hub is a project within our farm and food program. So, in this next section of the presentation, we're going to examine the key legal issues that are discussed in the new Massachusetts Community Kitchen Guide that we recently published. I'm going to explain what the Legal Food Hub is and how you can get legal help through us. And then we're going to talk with Stacey Wood from Whole Harmony, and she's going to talk about her business. And then we're going to use that as a case study to put some of these legal concepts into a more real world context. So starting with the Massachusetts Community Kitchen Guide, we published this in order to promote the shared use of existing kitchen space for organizations with kitchens they're willing to share community groups looking for kitchen space to use, and food entrepreneurs looking for kitchen space to use to make their products and then sell. What will you find in the guide? So you'll find a couple things in the guide. The main thing you'll find in the guide is an overview of legal issues that community kitchen operators and users should think about when starting or using a community kitchen. It's really meant as a starting point for your planning process, and it's meant to help community kitchens and their users identify these key legal issues. It's not conclusive, and we definitely encourage you to seek legal help if you have questions or concerns about how any of these issues apply to your specific organization. And later on in this presentation, I'll talk about how you can hopefully do that through the Legal Food Hub. And then at the end of the guide, you'll find a sample community use agreement, which lays out the key provisions that a contract for kitchen use should contain. So what that means is it lays out the expectations for both the kitchen operator and the kitchen user. The three key legal issues that we discuss in the guide are choosing a business structure, navigating the permitting process, and protecting against liability through risk management and insurance. We've identified these as really the three big legal issues that all community kitchen operators and users should think about. During this next section, I'm going to talk about these three issues very briefly. The guide itself has much more information, is much more comprehensive, and we hope that you know, after this presentation, you'll consult that guide. So the first legal issue that we talk about is choosing a business structure. This is important because it's going to affect how you make your business decisions, what kinds of funding are going to be available to you, what your risks and liability are, and how you will be taxed. The guide provides an overview of the different forms that your organization or business can take. And I know that I'm going to say this a few times throughout this presentation, but we then really recommend that you, you consult with a qualified attorney or an accountant when you're selecting your business structure, and they can talk with you more in depth about what the pros and cons are of the different structures. The guide itself includes a table that has a brief overview of the key features of the various types of business entities, and it talks about the different benefits and drawbacks to these business structures. And some of you here probably already have a business structure, and the guide is very useful 
um, in terms of reviewing the implications of what your business structure is. The permit process. So Cheryl talked a little bit more about this previously in a little bit more in depth. We're not going to talk too much about that here, other than to say that the types of permits and licenses that you're going to need is going to depend on who you are. So if you're you know, operating a community kitchen, if you're using a community kitchen and selling your products, or if you're using a community kitchen to make food for immediate consumption. And the best way to determine what permits and licenses you need is to contact your local health department. Towards the end of this presentation, when we talk about Whole Harmony, we'll be able to talk about some of the specific licenses and permits that they have had to get. Another thing to be aware of are some of the rules and regulations of the Food and Drug Administration and the United States Department of Agriculture. So the rules and regulations of these agencies are very vast. The ones that I've put up here are just a few of the ones that you should be aware of. I'm not gonna talk about them at all specifically other than to just go through and name them. Um, the preventative controls for human food, the current good manufacturing practices, food facility registration, acidified and low acid canned foods, and hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls. And Cheryl talked about some of these previously in her section. I will also point out that the FDA has a food safety plan builder on their website. That's a really great tool for you to determine the different rules and regulations and how they apply to your business. Protecting against liability, risk management, and insurance. So this means how you can manage risk and reduce the likelihood that an accident will occur for which you will be found liable. It's really two parts. So you wanna prevent accidents from occurring but if accidents do happen, you want to limit your liability. So we'll start just with a, a, a definition of what liability is, which is the legal responsibility for a harm associated with your organization. For example, if a visitor injures themselves at your kitchen or if they become ill after eating your product, then they could potentially sue you and collect money. So you wanna prevent that initial harm from happening, but then you also want to limit your liability for that harm if it does occur. We'll talk more specifically about some of the things that you can do to limit your liability when we talk about Whole Harmony. One of the main things that you can do, though, is to have proper insurance. And again, I say this a lot, but your guide is a great place to start to, to get just some basic information about different types of insurance that you should think about. And then we recommend that you consult an insurance broker to determine what exact coverage is right for your business. And again, it's really gonna depend on what type of um, organization you are. If you're a um, community group, a food entrepreneur, it's really gonna depend on your specific situation. So that brings us to the legal services that are available to you. Um, you know, the guide is a great starting point, but we encourage you to seek legal help if you have questions and concerns about how any of the issues raised in the guide apply to your organization. And you can begin, hopefully, by reaching out to the Legal Food Hub. So, what is a legal food hub? We help farmers, food entrepreneurs, or related organizations access free legal assistance. And we do this by matching eligible applicants with skilled attorneys who are willing to provide their legal services for free. The attorneys that are in our network have all been pre-screened and they're all experts in their field. The types of legal issues that we can help with are pretty much endless. Any legal issue that you can think of that a food entrepreneur um, or farmer might encounter you can probably help with. I've pointed out a few specific ones here that might be particularly relevant. We can help with entity formation and other corporate matters, food safety compliance, drafting contracts, real estate and zoning, and employment law. So how can we help you? Well, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is check our eligibility guidelines, and you can do that on our website. We have a link here. Um, in general, you need to be either a farmer, a food entrepreneur, or a food-related organization. And you need to be either a new business, meaning that you started operating within the last three years, or you need to have made at least $5,000 in the prior year. Your business cannot have a net annual income that exceeds $30,000, and your personal income cannot exceed 400% of the federal poverty level. We have a link on our website that brings you to the federal poverty guidelines to help you determine whether or not you meet that requirement. For food entrepreneurs, there is an additional requirement that you must source one of your ingredients locally from New England. It can be from anywhere in New England. It does not need to be the majority of your product or even a large part of it, but there does, there does need to be at least one locally sourced ingredient. Once you've determined that you are eligible for our services or if you're not sure whether or not you're eligible for our services, you can contact us in a couple different ways. You can call our intake hotline or you can fill out an online form. For additional information about the Legal Food Hub, you can go to our website. 
which brings us now to our case study. But before we start that, I want to introduce Stacey Wood, and she's going to talk a little bit about her business and how she has really benefited from the use of community kitchen space. I am Stacey Wood, founder and owner of Whole Harmony. We are herbalists and pharmacists. We are food manufacturers as well. We have a stunning artisan tea line, more botanical blends. They're purely herbal teas versus green tea or black tea. We grow a good amount of the herbs at our medicinal herb farm uh, located in Connecticut. And we also have an incredible uh, herbal tonic line. We create uh, an elderberry syrup and uh, folk fire and folk fire blood, which are wellness tonics, which you take little shots of. We were lucky enough to run across the Franklin County Community Development Corporation a few years back, and we were interested in a um, day-long class they taught about what it takes to become a food manufacturer from licensing to legal to the facility to scaling up your business um, and also the financial part as well. Um, after having taken this class, we decided that we were a perfect fit for their facility and we started utilizing them right away, which turned out to be a research and development for our an entire Elixir line that we also have, <laughs> which we're still in research and development on. But we started using them and are currently using them today. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to use Whole Harmony now as a case study um, to put some of the legal concepts that I talked about into more of a real-world context. And so Whole Harmony, they're a food entrepreneur. They have used a community kitchen space to make their products and then sell it. They make handcrafted artisan teas and tonics and elixirs using this community kitchen space. The business started as a sole proprietorship, and then as the business became more successful and grew, they converted first to an uh, an LLC and then to a corporation. They sell at both wholesale and retail. So what are some of the legal issues that they have had to consider throughout this whole journey and process? One of the first issues that they had to think about was what business structure um, they were going to create. So Stacy is going to talk a little bit about how um, they made the decisions that they did. Yes, when, we, when I very first started this company, I began our business as a sole proprietorship that I was able to do online. Uh, the reason that I did this is because I was the only person that owned the company. Our sales were very modest and also our liability wasn't as great. Uh, I was producing maybe a case or two of teas a week, selling them at our local farmer's markets. So our liability didn't have that big of an impact. A sole proprietorship was perfect for what my needs were at that time. It was also fairly inexpensive out of pocket. Great. And then as your business grew and as you became more concerned about limiting your liability and protecting your personal assets, you converted first to a limited liability company or an LLC, and then um, now you are currently a corporation. And I think the, the big takeaway here is that a sole proprietorship is a business entity where your personal assets are not protected and you um, cannot limit your personal liability. If something were to go wrong and you were to be found liable for something, they could go after your personal assets. And that's one of the main reasons that businesses often will convert to limited liability companies or corporations. Yes. Having gone through the initial stages of our business, I didn't realize at the time about liability and why a sole proprietorship at the time was perfect for what I had. But as the company evolved and we evolved as a company, it became clear that we were going to morph into an LLC. In probably a couple of months, a few key things happened to us. One was we won an award for best tea in Connecticut by the Connecticut um, Food Association. And while the award was wonderful and nice, uh, what that brought was some rather larger opportunities our way. And the more larger the opportunities, the usually the more uh, larger the liability. One of the opportunities was we were approached by Whole Foods and they wanted our products on their shelves. They thought that we were a perfect fit for who they are as a company. They really believed in what we were doing and what our company values are, what our mission is. So because of that, that Whole Foods has a gigantic liability. Um, insurance claim, they, they require a lot, uh, a lot more from you as a company. The other part that happened simultaneously, this all happened like in three weeks, is we um, 
In my prior job, I was a waitress, a server, and over the course of probably nine years, I waited on this couple, and they're wonderful people, and they watched, uh, they watched the company grow. Um, he is a uh, large businessman in Rhode Island, and um, I approached him because he always said, if you ever need any help with your business, please let me know. I can be a valuable resource. So I sent him an email and said, you know, we have a lot of opportunities right now, and I'm not really sure where we should put our energy into them. They all sound fantastic, but I'm not sure we can take them all on. And a lot of them require upfront money, and it just it's a whole other scale of business that I have no idea what to do or how to approach it. So we met for dinner um, at the restaurant <laughs> that I used to work at, the four of us, uh, David, my partner, and um, the couple. And um, from there, he became our third business partner, and he um, that's when we formed an LLC because it was no longer just myself as a sole proprietorship, but it was also two other people, and there was a lot more to Basically, the LLC was a really great way to buffer uh, everybody personally from any kind of liability that uh, might happen going forward. So we formed that. We got into Whole Foods. There were a lot of hoops to jump for that. Uh, it took us over a year and a half to complete that process. But when we did, we all jumped for joy, mainly because it took so long, but it was completed. But the other thing, you know, we, grew, we learned a tremendous amount through that process, um, exactly what liability is. And probably one of the biggest things was having a recall plan in, pro, in place. There's like a 38-page document I have, and it's a complete start-to-finish recall plan if something goes wrong with one of our products, if there's a sickness breaks out, um, if someone, a whole group of people get ill. We know as a company what to do, how to put this plan in action, and how to help all the entities that are going to come. They want to know exactly where the source of the uh, illness um, transpired from. So we realized in this process how crucial and critical documentation of every single raw cost of good that we bring in or produce from our farm. Our records used to be scribbled on pieces of paper are now taking up whole cabinet files. Um, for every product that we make, and everything's dated, everything's timed, everything uh, is lauded uh, from lot numbers. We've created our own lot numbers. All this documentation that's put into place specifically for a recall plan in case anyone ever got sick or ill from our products, they'd be able to trace the source of the illness. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the licenses and permits that um, Stacy and Whole Harmony had to get for their business. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just point out that um, the requirements are state by state, and Massachusetts has its own requirements, and Whole Harmony, as a Connecticut company, um, has slightly different requirements. So she's going to talk a little bit about the requirements that Connecticut has and what permits and licenses she was required to get. And then I just note on the slide here that in Massachusetts, there are slightly different requirements. And that's something, I think, an important takeaway from this. When we originally started out uh, as a business, we actually rented space from an already established restaurant. So we use that uh, space, which is what's called our base of operations. I vividly remember calling the Department of Consumer Protection and asking them um, for help. I needed to know how I can produce my products when I didn't have my own certified licensed kitchen. And I met with one of the agents and he said, well, you need to have a base of operations. And he gave me a few ideas. So I, a friend of mine uh, owned a restaurant and said, yes, you, you're more than welcome to use our kitchen. Uh, they're closed one day a week. So every Tuesday I was able to go down there and make my product. So the consumer protection agent came down inspected the um, establishment, but also inspected my um, process, which meant how was I making my teas? Um, how was my cleanliness? Um, was I checking the jars for 
breakage? Was I inspecting the um, raw goods? Was I um, lotting everything? Was I labeling everything? Did I have my FDA, um, you know, what was my labeling like? Um, all of that stuff. So he gave me some feedback of what I needed to do to get uh, licensed at that base of operations. And then I did the requirements that he requested. He came back down and I got certified uh, or I got licensed at the base of operation. From that point, I was able to go on to do farmers markets, craft fairs. I was able to do a lot more um, than what I was initially doing. Uh, fast forward a year and a half when we became an LLC um, and we got our um, other business partner, we uh, built our own licensed kitchen. We actually have a certified licensed kitchen in Connecticut now where we're able to um, do our food manufacturing. Through that, um, I got my own food manufacturing licensing with the consumer protection agent. Yet again, at this address, um, I also went through my serve safe manager certification um, and I registered with the FDA several times for several different products. Um, my license kitchen currently right now, we are only designated to make uh, our tea there. We are not registered yet to do um, any tonics or elixirs or anything else. But in the works, we will be doing some, I do wanna get uh, an acidified food license. I'm an acidified food license person, but my establishment isn't yet. So there's many certifications that you have to have individually and um, as a whole. When we talked about the business structure that you determined made the most sense for your, your business, one of the things we talked about was your concerns about limiting liability. So managing risk and reducing liability um, has been something that your business has thought about. And um, some of the things that you've done in order to do that was form a business entity that limits liability, which we, we you just talked about, the LLC and the corporation. Um, you obtained all necessary licenses and permits. You also obtained appropriate insurance coverage and you entered into a community use agreement with the Franklin County Community Development Center. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the business structure and the licenses and permits, but can you talk more about the types of insurance coverage you've been required to get and a little bit about the community use agreement that you've entered into? When we originally started out uh, our company, we got what was called a farmer's market uh, insurance coverage for our products, and it was purely for goods. It just literally covered us at farmer's markets. It was very inexpensive. I believe we paid, I think, $125 a year to have $3,000 uh, worth of coverage for the entire year, uh, or in case anybody got sick or got hurt. It was a very, very small coverage, but at the time, being a small business, a much smaller business or a beginner business, um, that was what we could, um, that was what we could do, that was what we could afford, and uh, that was what we were on par with. Um, having grown, when we moved and got our own uh, licensed kitchen, um, we had to get, um, insurance for the inside of the building, insurance for the employees, workman's comp. We had to get insurance for our products um, and all of our um, equipment that we were using. So our policy jumped up um, quite a bit. Um, it jumped up to, I believe, over $1,000 a year, um, but our policy also jumped up in um, coverage. It also, I believe, it jumped up to $2 million. Yeah, that's a general policy. Um, and now we're looking at doing our next jump because we may or may not have an opportunity to go on QVC and they require a $5 million policy for uh, food. Well, actually they require $5 million policy for supplements and our tonics are um, presently in talks with lawyer right now to get supplement labels versus nutritional labels. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about um, the community use agreement? So being um, clients up at the Franklin County Community Development Center, um, we are, were given, you know, an agreement that uh, clearly states what the use of the facility would entail, uh, you know, what we could and could not do, what the hourly um, uh, payment is, um, labor should there need be, cleanliness, cleanliness is at the top of that list, um, and how to use the machines and um, how to use uh, some of the equipment um, and how to 
you know, label everything, um, where our space is, where it isn't, how to use the docs. Um, speaking with Elizabeth, she has a lot of, um, a tremendous amount of licenses. So a lot of times when we were there, we were able to use uh, Elizabeth's licenses as a co-packing um, brand or a co-packing company. All right, thank you very much to all of our speakers on this webinar. That was excellent information. And we know that everybody who is listening to this probably has many questions and we want to answer them. But since this is a recorded webinar, we can't answer them live. So we do encourage you to contact us. We have listed our email addresses uh, on this slide and we look forward to your questions and comments and feedback then to responding to them. Thank you very much for participating.